travelers and welcome to the virtual stars podcast how my loyal listeners thank you for your continued support and remember click the subscribe button everybody it's an amazing episode because stephanie Tchaikovsky boards the mothership you know her as hammerhead on the doom patrol on hbo max she now plays lieutenant taveen on the third season of star trek picard come aboard as we go traversing the stars hello mr Tchaikovsky. thank you so much for coming to the virtual stars podcast Thank you so much, Jeff. It's such a pleasure to be here. It's an absolute honor to have you on the show. You are fantastic. People from know you from Doom Patrol and that's such a card, so great honor to speak with you. Oh, well, I think the honor's mine, but thank you. Thank you. You know, so, it's, it always makes me feel nice. It is. As I mentioned off here, you're going to be compl- uh, become geek royalty anytime now, so it's good to have you before you become uber, uber geek royalty. Uh, well, I, you know, I hope so. I think, I, think, I, I think it's just like I've attached myself to some iconic coattails, and I'm like, take me <laughs> Well, I always start off with a question of inspiration. So what inspired your love of acting and who your earliest influence is? Um, Unequivocally, my earliest influence was Olivia and john um, and the Brady Bunch. There is a semi, well, I don't, not infamous story, but reportedly when I was five years old, I was watching the Brady Bunch in syndication on channel 12, ABC in Wisconsin. And I asked my mom to write a letter to channel 12 and asked them if I could be on the Brady Bunch because I thought like, I think it was when Oliver came on that I was like, well, they got other kids now, like I can be on this. And so she sent a letter to the the local station asking, you know, for me. And they wrote back and they're like, well, you should get into, you know, modeling and acting first. And that's kind of where it started that. And then I saw like a bootleg copy of um, Grease from my aunt. I think it wasn't a bootleg. It was like, she was my aunt my aunt had money and they had a video player they had a video cassette player and so i saw a video cassette like a vhs tape of um of greece olivia newton john and i was like i want to be an actor i want to be a singer i want to do all these things and then it just went from there we may have to explain to the listeners what a vhs is oh yes oh yes so it is it is a it is an archaic technology <laughs> way before laser discs and disc players. Actually, laser discs, the big ones came out at the same time. It is a tape that you can find at the Goodwill that you place <laughs> into a machine, you push down, and then you watch a, a movie on it. <laughs> so so what was about the Brady Bunch that got that was excited? I mean, I'm trying to imagine Hammerhead sitting by watching Brady Bunch. Watching the Brady Bunch? I don't know. Like, I honestly don't know. I think it was the fact that, I mean... As I go through my life and I work on projects, I am a big fan of doing stuff that that is ensemble based, mm. like where there's a big group of people and you're working together. So I think that that interconnectedness of the family really struck me how they were all working together. And and I just felt like, oh, specifically when Cousin Oliver came along, like there could be a place for me. I, I, have, I have no idea what was the thing about it, but like something, you know, in watching that was like, I can do that. I can do that. <laughs> so how, what is it about ensemble pieces? Like, is, what is it about that community acting that is you just feel is better, is stronger? Well, I don't know that it's better, but I um, I come from a theater background. I was I went to NYU. I went to Tisch. I did um, some training there. And then I was fortunate enough to be in one of the first years of Stefano Theater Company's ensemble training program. And there's something about working with an ensemble because, you know, because theater and film, it's it's a collective. It's a collective of artists coming together to try to create this thing. Mm. And that the teamwork aspect of it is something that I really enjoy. And I feel, you know, very fulfilled in that aspect of being a part of something. I mean, obviously, I like to do heavier lifting and being like a major part of something. But there is nothing quite like when you're on set and at certain points specifically in Picard because we did some block shooting we would like as opposed to you know you have your script and it's scene and then it goes to another scene and we would do them like one long scene all intercut so it feels like this thing that moves and grows and everybody's energy contributes to it so it brings out 
a larger sense of play, I think. I mean, especially when you're doing it on, you know, on a set, because, you know, it, you're basically dressing in costume performing for no one. <laughs> Whereas <laughs> like in um, theater, there's an audience that's giving that energy back. And so there's just something really magical about, there's something really magical about large or about groups coming together with the same purpose. Like, you know, in its own right, I feel like it's the same kind of feeling you have for people who go to church, like for people who go to church, people go to music, comp, uh, you know, concerts, people, people in bars, like it's, it's a sense of community that's just really specific to, you know, this particular, this particular art form. You, you kind of, I mean, I, I, having being someone who can't act myself, and I'm definitely not an actor. Um, I think I always when I think of an actor, I think someone who likes having the spotlight on them. So when you're in a community setting, you have to kind of relinquish that aspect to to take part of the team aspect. So yeah. how do you approach something differently when the idea is not necessarily to have it spotlight on you, but to kind of coalesce within this larger area, this larger group? Well, I think depending upon what your background is, as far as as an actor, like, you know, they always say, or I don't even, was it Miser who said, or there is a, there's a, a phrase that is not overused that acting is reacting. It's not you just doing all these things. It's living, living truthfully in a set of circumstances. And in order to do that, when you're with another person, you have to be in it with them. Mm -hmm. And so I think your performance shines the more invested you are in your in your partner. I think the same thing is true for um it's like weird, like weird trivia, like factoid. Um Todd Stashwick, who plays my captain, mm -hmm. was also someone who had a improv studio. He he's a longtime improv actor from Chicago, from Second City, but he had an improv studio in North Hollywood that I went to. And he was my teacher and he and his partner were my teacher and there they did a lot of spolen and it was, it was very much about interacting with that, that person and that kind of work, that kind of, that kind of energy exchange is, is something that you can't compare to anything else. And it creates life in a way that not just standing there by yourself, like, you, you know, you are in it together. Um, mm. I think if you do it well, I mean, honestly, like, you know, there's stories about how, you know, because sometimes just like the camera's on you and there are a lot of actors, which I prefer. And I, I believe, you know, most of in watching other actors on specifically this show who were interacting with one another, they were kind enough to be next to the camera and to give you what you needed. Cause mm. there's been times that I've been on sets where like, dudes are out and you're acting to, you know, this, to the, you know, the scripty or you're acting to someone who's not your partner. And that's, that's so generous mm. of another actor to do specifically when they don't need to be there. I think there's a story about Pedro Pascal doing that in the last, ep one of the last episodes of the last of us. And I just, I just, I just think that being that kind of performer, that kind of artist, that kind of scene partner makes everybody shine. You know, and I think that's fantastic because it sounds, as you mentioned, the idea of Meisner and Meisner technique all about, yeah, you said react to the person and it's really is connected to what that person is going to do. Mm -hmm. How, I mean, that's your training. It must be almost impossible to train, a, to act against a guy holding a script, just staring at you like a blank face. This is my line. Just do your part. Yeah. yeah. I mean, <laughs> well, I mean, that's for all intents and purposes, that's, you know, auditioning. That's, you know, most of our job a lot of the time is auditioning, like being in a weird room. Sometimes if you're lucky, you have another actor who can read with you, but specifically in a pandemic, you're sending self tapes and, you know, I'm having my husband read with me who has got a great voice, but is not necessarily the most, you know, the best actor in the world, which he fully admits. Um, and so you've got to learn to really grow that sense of imagination, which, mm. you know, is the fun part about this is, is the letting go of the idea that at any age you're not allowed to have a very active imagination you know mm. I, th I think that's absolutely awesome so you're basically once again going to the idea of Meisner if there's no one to react to are you imagining the reaction then um not when I'm with the person like okay you know not when I'm with the person like it I mean the you know exercises in Meisner and like I've only had I'm not like a Meisner based actor I've had some training in it but it's the you are taking your reaction off of someone else like Ideally, I think, and I someone once said this, and I can't quote who it is because I'm not sure that, 
you know, theater is you rehearse it to find it. And in film and television, you build all the things and then you just let it fly and see what happens and hopefully mm. catch the moment on film. So it's, you know, you can over rehearse something and like basically kill it. And, <laughs> you know, and that's, that's the exciting thing about being on film. Like, I mean, you can start, stop and start or film and television, you can stop and start, but also sometimes just magic happens when you fuck up, like, <laughs> you know, so, you know, you, you don't know what's going to happen or something weird happens or someone changes something or you're, you're in a groove and something new comes up. That's just, is better for telling a story, you know? Yeah. So how and how excited uh, was uh, Todd Sashik when he saw one of his students on uh, on the Titan with him? <laughs> um, well, um, I think he considers me his friend too, so that's <laughs> nice. Um, but he got I don't know if I saw his name first, but I got a Facebook message that was like, "Hey, I see you're on my uh, bridge crew," and I was like, "Oh my god, are you playing the captain?" And he was like, "I'm your captain," and I was like, "Holy shit!" <laughs> So it was just, it was a lovely reunion because, you know, we had just been through the pandemic. So most everybody was kind of staying at home and mm. I hadn't seen him in person, God, in a couple of years. So it was so lovely to sit in real life. Because I mean, the great thing about social media is you think you you, you have a kind of a weird false sense of intimacy with people because you know what's going on in their lives if they're on social media. And then you're like, oh, so what's that? And, but <laughs> Being in real life, you're like, oh, should I be talking about? I don't even know, you know. <laughs> I, that, that is an interesting, uh, an interesting point about social media. It does give someone, especially even like me or whatever, this thought that you can just reach out, reach out to this person and be like, hi, how are you? Know, let's, you know, yeah. and, you're, and you think to yourself, this person really has no reason to talk to me. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, I think it's, I think it's, it's weird. And at the same time, it's wonderful. Like it's, you know, it's, if people are open to it, it's not, it's, and I think it's, it's one of those things of trying to recognize, cause I've done the same thing. I've reached out to people to be like, Hey, what's going on? Um, sometimes with some drinks, you know, <laughs> um, but at the same time, that is the wonderful thing about the, about this world wide web, like, you know, Twitter's and you know, all the, if Twitter is going to, there's all the talk is Twitter going to die, whatever, whatever. but there is an opportunity to connect with like-minded people who live so far away from you mm. that you would never necessarily meet doing going about your normal day. And that is invaluable. That is, you know, connections and friends that you ne you never would have made without that. Like I've, I've made friends, like I've made, I, I, I was, I'm always like, I've made friends with some of my, fa like some of my fans, like I've become friendly in like a more interpersonal way. Mm. And, you know, I, I had multiple cancers years ago and there's like a whole cancer that like, I have a bunch of cancer friends now that I hang out with, like who I met on Twitter. Like, it's a weird, it's a weird world we live in. It's a weird world we live in. And especially once again, as we went, met, referenced earlier that you've been now, you're moving now in the geek circles and then with the, anything, you know, people that know about geeks is that they're dedicated individuals. They have oh, hardcore they fan bases and now you're in the Doom Patrol fan base. You're now in the Star Trek fan base. And as you mentioned, you're on social media. How is that interaction with these fan bases to be, I mean, I know especially Star Trek fan bases are basically anyone who's in anything of Star Trek immediately gets embraced by this huge fan what a fan base what is that this whole thing like for you i don't think i was ready fully i had been warned i you know i had had some interaction with doom patrol fans um you know and the dc you know the dc aspect of it um and i remember i was supposed to go to my first convention i was supposed to go to rhode island last year and i ended up when I ended up not going because Diane who plays Jane was going to go. And then she, and they ended up canceling, I think, cause she was doing Encanto live. I think is why she didn't go. And I kind of was like, well, it seems like, you know, I can show up, but I feel like it makes more sense if I show up, if she shows up, like, mm. I don't know if I have that kind of, I don't know if I have that kind of juice, you know, like, I don't know if anyone's going to want to see me. Right. And yeah, I had some other stuff going on. So, and I remember when I posted like, Oh, I'm going to this comic con and my showrunner is like, yeah, that's a good starter one. You just wait. And I was like, what are you talking about? And, you know, it was one of those things that the premiere, you know, Terry, our showrunner, was so incredibly generous in 
in in the entire process it's specifically with me like in terms of creating you know just deciding who my character was how mm. you know she if she was a Vulcan, like with the bald head, all the things, like I had questions and he was very open and very collaborative. But when we, as the bridge crew, you know, me and Jin and Joseph got invited to the premiere as part of the cast, not that we're not, but you know, I mean, we're on a show with like, you know, Sir Patrick Stewart and Jerry Ryan and like the, like the big kids, like the, the kids, right. the guys. And so you think, well, yeah, I'll go and I'll, you know, I'll end up going to the party because of course I'll do that. But there was something so lovely and so I think generous about being like, this is my bridge crew introducing us on Twitter, like making a point to be like, this is who they are and they are part of this and we get to walk the red carpet. And, and then to do that, and then to, you go through and you, you know, you, you, you mug for the cameras and you fancy clothes and you do some interviews and then, you know, with who's ever on that line. And then you go and you get to interact with the group of fans that they had there. And they, they allowed, there were some of them, but they were, they were pretty small in comparison to the vast array of Star Trek fans there are throughout the world. You know, the fact that this was launching in the United States and Canada on a Thursday and then was worldwide the next day is remarkable because it's the, I mean, it's the biggest thing I've ever been part of. Mm. So the fact that that's been happening and I'm, I'm a little bit more active on Twitter now than I ever was before, because there seems to be a lot of interaction there. And for me, I think it's, it's part of it. It's, you know, it's part of kind of not the job. It's, it's a welcome in my estimation, a part of the job because I love what I do and I love this show so genuinely. So I am all about wanting to talk about it. Like, I'm like, yeah, let's talk about it. Let's, let's look at fan art. Like the amount of fan art there is and it exists and, and how talented fans are and how they're willing to put this time and effort into, you know, portraits. I've seen a portrait of Todd and his posters. Like, I'm just in awe and I'm really, really grateful to be part of this thing they love so much. And I really want to make sure that I give it the proper due because that kind of love and devotion deserves respect. And, and as someone who lives in Rhode Island, been to Rhode Island Comic Con, shout out to Rhode Island Comic Con. Yeah. <laughs> if you ever come back, I'll definitely be there. Um, and, and the other great thing with, you know, with, with, with Star Trek as well is that, once again, the characters on the show are they, they highlighted highlighted them so well there was a trailer for each these new titan characters which i thought was tremendous because once again it was a the, it was a star trek next generation third yep. season organization but they spent so much time talking about some of the titan crew and i thought that was once again extremely impressive were you like what what how did you feel about seeing that trailer and what they thought about how they presented your character i i was i was so i mean touched like it sounds kind of trite but i was just like I was so a little flabbergasted because I was like, me? Like, it was very much like a Sally Field, like, they really like me. <laughs> My producers like me. But, you know, again, it's one of those things of this, it, it trickles down from Terry. It trickles down to from who our showrunner is. Like, he genuinely loves this franchise. He genuinely loves these characters. And from soup to nuts, he loves everything about it. It's not like, oh, we're going to stick some Vulcan ears on you and you're going to do the thing. It's no, you're Tavine. Like, we are going to, you know, we're not going to, it's not going to be a case because, again, it's Picard. It's not like the Devine show. But we're going to give, you know, you some camera time. We're going to give you lines or whatever. But we're also going to pay attention to who you are because you inhabit this world. And I feel like the more that our showrunners, and like I said, for me, make you feel like you are, part of this collaboration you are part of this bigger ensemble mm. the harder you want to work to bring everything they've envisioned to life you know and be, being star trek are you ready to be a comic book are you ready to be a toy action figure oh my God. are you ready for I all this i want to be, a, to be a funko <laughs> so bad like i just, like i want to be a I want to be like, yeah, I'm like, come on. I got the bald head. Like, come on. <laughs> I think I remember coming out of, um, out of shooting 
because you know Tavine's at Tavine's at her station and there's a lot of like I remember just like a lot of re- of my reaction shots which we haven't seen full moment like kind of over the shoulder and I'm I'm hoping that we ended up using one of them because I just want to I want a meme that's like really like <laughs> <laughs> the ear and the shoulder like yeah <laughs> You know, that's going to happen. You're th- This is going to be posted to all Star Trek groups. Be ready for the memes. The meme parade will be coming the for meme you. The meme parade. Yeah, I'm, I'm like, bring it, dude. I like, <laughs> I'm like, the idea of having a, you know, the idea of having a Funko character. I think at one point, one of our fans from Doom Patrol made Lego figurines. Oh. Like, they didn't, like, they weren't mass produced, but made, like, a hammerhead Lego fi- And I was like, hell yeah, dude. <laughs> <laughs> that's going to be awesome. You know, someone on Redbubble, someone on Redbubble made t-shirts. I bought my husband a t-shirt of me because someone used my face. And I was kind of like, I'm Hammerhead. I'm probably <laughs> digital from you with my face on it. Um, Maybe, like, I'm not going to stop you. I'm not going to, like, cease and desist you because I'm not, like, fandom is fandom. And I don't want to put a stop on that. But I'm also just like, like, literally, I have a water bottle with my own face on it. Like, <laughs> so I'm like... Cause I'm like, why not? Why not? So, so when you become that action figure, the big question will be, do you display it mint in package or do you take it out of display and put it on a stand? Oh no, no. I think I'm, I think I'm mint in package. You're making fashion person. Yeah, my, my, I don't have that many action figure, like figures dolls. Like I have an Elvis doll. Oh. I have an Elvis, uh, Elvis Eagle suit doll. He's still in the package. Like I, <laughs> I tend to, I learned my lesson. I learned my lesson from uh cabbage patch dolls. <laughs> I should have kept them in the package. They're worth nothing. Absolutely <laughs> nothing. But you know. So as we're talking, you, you play Lieutenant Tavine in uh, Star Trek Picard Season 3, which is, so far, it's one of the best seasons I think they've had in Star Trek in a long time. It's so good. So when you yeah. got the part of Tavine, what was the backstory they gave you and how much um, backstory are we actually going to get as fans about her? Um, They did not give us anything, really. They, okay. when they, when we started, um, it was because everything is very top secret. Um, the sides were, you were a science officer. I don't even remember what random name they used. And they were like, mm, audition. I, um, I was like, I think this science officer is a Vulcan. Cause in my, like, I, that's like, I was like, it feels like, I don't know. It feels like a Vulcan. So that's what I did it. I did it thinking that I was a Vulcan. And then when I got to, I got the job, um, I was like, holy shit, I'm going to join the Star Trek universe. Oh, holy shit. <laughs> like, um, and then I went up, I got my car and went up because those, those costumes take a lot of fittings because they are very, very intricate in their own way. Like they're very, suits are hard, man. Suits are hard. And they did a really good job. So you had a bunch of fittings to make sure <laughs> they all look good. Um, and when I was up, I was actually, I tried on some wigs, like, we got there. They had decided I was Vulcan. Apparently, my take on it was, I don't know, right? They agreed or a Vulcan. Like, and then I tried on the hair. Um, they put some wigs on me. They looked. <laughs> I have these pictures, and I, I don't have the pictures of me, and I wish I did. But like, they they weren't my. They really weren't my look. They didn't really do anything for me. Mm. At the time, I was bald. Um, I tried on my ears. And then before I was going to leave, they sent, um, they called up and asked me, they called me and asked me to come back down to the production office because Ter- Terry, and I hadn't met Terry yet. I was like, Terry, you know, Terry wanted to talk to me. And I was like, oh my God. Terry's like, hey man, what's up? Like, he was just so cool. And he was like, so, you know, hair, what do you think? He's like, bald? Do you think it's bald? Because I had shaved my, you know, I had a sh- had shaved head from, you know, first Doom Patrol. And then I had done um, MacGruber, I had worked on MacGruber and I had slightly longer hair in MacGruber as like this like badass, you know, this badass killer. Um, And I shaved it off again for this audition and for another audition. And I was like, I'm not really sure. And he's like, are there bald Vulcans? I'm like, I'm not sure. Like I know bald and I think like, you know, Star Trek the movie, but I'm not sure if it turns out she's Delta. So he was like, well, here's my email. Let's think on it. Like, go away, let's, you know, email me and, you know, decide what you think, you know. And so I did a deep dive into lots of memory alpha and, you know, Star Trek movies, like, are there bold Vulcans? Who are they? Blah, blah, blah. And there are some, they're very old and most, you know, but also Vulcans can live to like 220. Like they look pretty old. 
And, you know, there were, there was, you know, Ilya, this Delton from Star, Star Trek, the movie. And I was kind of like, well, what if, you know, let's make her bald. And like, what if she's not fully Vulcan? Like, what if there's a little bit of Delton in there? Like, what happens if like, you know, she's not Delton, but like, what if, you know, her grandma is just De- like, what do you think, Terry? He's like, yeah, dude, I can see that. Like, like what is for gram like quarter yeah i could do quarter i'm like great okay good and then and then we left it at that you know but it, again it's not something it's something fully for me like it's something for me as an actor it, it this is we're not going to like delve into like wow you know cuz it's it's an interesting thing to play with and in terms of how you react just because at least for me i was like vulcans are so interesting historically in terms of really diving into what that character is right who this character is and then for me throwing in that little like a spice of like what happens if there is you know some characteristics that are dealt in what does that do internally does it change anything we're doing on set no it just it i think it informs it i think it just makes to mean more a fuller character as it were but like once we decided who she was then it was you know we decided that she was, you know, mostly, you know, mostly Vulcan, some Delton, bald, bald head, bald head Delton, right? Um, that's that's the one characteristic we definitely got. The rest of him are left up for discussion at another time, or, you know, in one of those novels, like maybe I'm going to write a novel, you know, <laughs> Beta, like you know, I actually saw one of those like where they had done like a sexy, you know, fan fiction. Like maybe I'll do my own fan fiction. But, <laughs> But then, but then what happened is, is the production office, the secretary was a giant fan and gave me, sent me a list of, you know, basically to go to Trek school a little bit, to go to Vulcan school, you know, to, you know, a mock time gave me episodes from the original series, a mock mm. time, et cetera. And then other from enterprise, things like that. And then, like I said, I dove super heav- heavily into memory alpha and on fandom because Fans are the best. They're kind of the best resource because they've compiled all this information mm. in one place to be able to access it. And also to know that if you're doing this, if you're walking into a character that's as iconic as, you know, that's as iconic as a Vulcan, who is also a science officer <laughs> that like brings up, you know, feelings of Spock, you better be familiar with your canon. You better mm. be making sure whatever choices you're making are based in things that have already been established. I mean, that's also, and like I said, and because you're talking about it, it's your character, whatever you say at this point becomes canon. So if you want to give some details about your character, it maybe becomes canon. Everything becomes canon. Like, yeah, there's, you know, I have, I mean, but also at the same time, I'm like, you know, no one wants to, there's a thing of like, no one wants to hear your actor process. Like, I have my story. I like the 25% of, uh, I like my grandmother being Dalton. I like all the aspects of that. I think the detailed details are to be, you know, looked at at a later date because I think also in doing that, it may lend itself to something else that is, you know, I don't know. I, like, I'm not gonna be like, it's gonna be a Tavine series. I mean, <laughs> no, I mean, whatever, but also, I like, you know, I love the fact that when I went off, it's like, okay, you're a Vulcan. Hey, Tara, what do you think about this? Yeah, great. Okay, go off and do it. Mm. And then, you know, if you're going to craft story, again, going further with that, then you go along that way. But as opposed to being like, we're going to add fully to the canon. I'm just going to like, I'm not going to confirm nor deny anything that I want to add because you know, I've already had a conversation and I would have to vaporize you if I told you. So, you know. <laughs> well, I mean, Picard is ending with season three. Titan yeah. is a really well-liked crew already. I'm just saying they're ready to make a second spinoff series. The Titan seems to be the logical choice at this point. <laughs> you know, you would hope. You would hope, you know. Mm. But you would, I mean, you would hope. I I mean, you go into this, I go into this, you know, you go into this being like, this is, this, this is the last season and this may be, you know, the last, I'm always like, this could be the last job I ever have. I mean, not that, but like, you just have to enjoy it for what it is. And yeah, you can hope like, oh, maybe, but it's the best thing you can do is just do the best job at where you are and Mm. be in the place that you are. Because trying to think down the road, 
negates enjoying what you have in the moment and this is this is this is quite a fucking ride dude I, I, quite a fucking ride. I can't imagine how awesome that is to be part of this that Star Trek, especially like I said the last season of Picard and yeah. the one thing I people have all talked already talked about Lieutenant uh, Tavine about um that that seems to be canon and already part of the whole story is that it's been said that uh, four captains lobbied to have Lieutenant Tavine on right. their ship. That seems to be the right. thing that's everyone that's covered. It's already been talked about. Yeah. So have I assume you've discussed with Terry uh, uh, Matalus. I don't. I shouldn't call him Terry. I don't even know the guy. Matalus. But, uh, Mr. Matalus. Yeah. If you want to come to the show, feel free. Anyways, um, what made when you discuss Tavine? What makes Tavine so in demand that these four captains all lobbied? for her. her services i think i mean i really do think that's where the delton comes into play like we always talk about delton and being like oh it's all sex and pheromones I'm like well she turned on the pheromones and everyone has sex with her and i and, and i'm like that's such an easy like like the but you know when you start going here we go when you start going down that memory alpha um hole a little bit in terms of okay you know you have vulcans and their capacity is larger for understanding science, et cetera, than humans. Cause we always like, what do we, we always base everything on humans. Cause that's what we know. Cause we are mm. right. But then when you extrapolate, when you step away from the idea that deltons are only pheromones and sex, you know, there's also, again, like to like quote my memory, my memory alpha, they're also equipped with, you know, the acuity to understand trigonometry, et cetera, at such a high level, which is talked about, which is again talked about in, in uh, memory alpha, et cetera, but they're never referred to it in that way. Cause it's always about their sensuality and all that other stuff. And so when I'm looking at, okay, if there's a portion of me, if my, you know, if I'm 25% Delta to me, it's 25% Delta. What if those characteristics are adding to the fact that she already is really astute when it comes to science mm. and astute when it comes to, you know, you know, the Vulcans technically are, you know, touch telepaths, but the more developed your mind gets, you're also kind of telepathic in the sense of being able to read the room around you. And I think it's a combination of all those things. I think it's just, you know, the ability to read the room around you, the ability to be calm under pressure, decisive, able to decipher things that are going on that you're not, I mean, that's the science officer's job to go through and look at an anomaly and be able to break it down to into what it is. Mm. And I think that her ability to do that while still honor the chain of command in, in a way that doesn't disrespect her intelligence, that doesn't disrespect, you know, cause you know, shock can be a little trying, I think, <laughs> um, but you know, doesn't disrespect the you know chain of command or her fellow, her fellow crew. Um, you know, I think we can go back and, you know, if, depending upon how long she's been on the Titan, which I think, you know, we decided like maybe four years, four or five years, you know, before that, I think that, you know, you've been in some sticky situations where she's been able to step up and, you know, show that she is a reliable and a great member to have on your bridge in terms of yes logic and stuff but i also think that there is a deep 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 loyalty mm -hmm. and an ability to suppress whatever emotions as vulcans do and do what needs to be done to make sure that her crew and that ship and her captain remain safe now, as, as you mentioned, she's a tele telepath. She knows, the, you know, how her crew's doing, feelings for her crew. There's a lot of tension on that bridge, apparently, between Seven of Nine and Shaw. And Shaw is an interesting character, kind of an ass. Yeah. How do you think Tavin feels about the chemistry on this bridge between these two and Shaw himself? I think that, I think that she's aware of you know, you can just be like, oh, it's just tension and he's just an asshole. But I think she's smart enough to understand the overall arcing situations. Like, I think that Tavine, instead of being someone who would jump to a jump to a conclusion, is weighs everything. 
-hmm. weighs all the circumstances of an individual. I think there's a big sense of curiosity to anyone who comes on the ship Mm -hmm. so that you're not just, I, I think that there's a good sense of instinct and, you know, kind of, not, well, not telepathy. I'm like, I'm like, oh, the Dalton side. I'm like, really? but like a little bit of like, woo, 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 that kind of is like has a feeling about someone, but also is willing to be like, okay, I'm gonna, I know that's there, but I'm also going to assess the situation in a larger, in a larger sense, as opposed to just this one thing I'm seeing. And mm-hmm. I think that she's been with this crew, specifically the captain, long enough that she understands where he's coming from. Mm. And I also think that when, you know, seven of nine, when, you know, Hanson came on, you know, when Jerry came on, that she makes it her business to know who people are. Not because she's trying to, like, we used, we used to, and I think I think it's a little true in the actual characters while it bled over into my interaction with um, my crew, but, you know, Joseph, who plays Mura, Whenever we get a new script, I'd be like, you know, we weren't sure what was going to happen next. I'd be like, I bet, blah, 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 blah. Like I, I like pontificate about things that might happen. And when they came true, I was like, yes. <laughs> and um, I told you so. And um, Joseph used to, <laughs> used to, when I get all ex- excited about it, he'd call me Tavin MZ. He'd be like, you want to know us, Tavin MZ. <laughs> but I do think like that is rooted in something that Tavin makes a point of not to get in between people's get in between people's conflict mm. but to be aware of why it exists mm. do you think Tavine was happy that out of the four captains she got stuck with Shaw do you think this was a, a, the the outcome she was looking for or do you think she's like eh, okay <laughs> I'm with Shaw. I think based on the I think based on the talent of the bridge crew yeah I think, you know, I think we're going to learn, you know, we, we only know Shaw, we only know Shaw from people taking over a ship. We only know Shaw from people like getting on a ship and deciding they're, you know, they're going to determine what he does. And that's kind of an unfair place to judge Mm. a person, right? You can't judge them from, from simply because you like someone, how someone else reacts to them. Like, you know what I mean? Mm. So, I mean, we, there's, Shaw's got a lot of story and he's, you know, Shaw's got a lot of story and I, it's a really interesting story. And so, you know, without giving away spoilers, like, I think that I totally forgot what the question was now, um, but, but I think that she is, she is fine, fine to be on his ship, fine to be on his ship. Because I also don't think, that he treats her with any disrespect. Like, Mm. I don't, you know, I think there's definitely some, you know, rub with, with uh, Jerry and with him, but I think that's also growing pains of recognizing where your, what your role is when you're talking about chain of command is, you know, if you're used to being a ranger and suddenly you're on a thing that has these specific things, it's, it's a weird thing to try to fit yourself into it. If, if you don't have a captain who is a little more flexible to that. But, mm. you know, I mean, as episode two showed us, like he was just like, all right, let's fucking go. Like, I mean, <laughs> so it's not, you know, I think, I mean, that scene meeting him in the, in while well, he's eating that steak, I mean, that steak is genius and he's so good at it. Like, it's just so, she, he's just so good at that. So, it gives you the reason to be like, uh, but also you have to cut him some slack, even though, you know, these guys who are coming on and trying to like take off with his ship are your heroes. Like, you know what I mean? Like it's, you know, I think you just, I think across the board to MO, at least when it comes to taking in people and assessing situations is both intuitively and logically i think there's a strong sense of both i think she is pretty good intuition about people Mm. but also is logical about how she goes about deciding or not deciding on who they are so from the sound of that does it sound like we're gonna be spending quite a lot of time with titan over the course of the car season three or you know we're talking like 
most of the season, half the rest of the season? Well, you know, <laughs> there's some, I mean, we're definitely going to spend episode three because, like, I, I would imagine so. <laughs> we're it's definitely episode three. I can let you know that much. <laughs> <laughs> Will they make it to episode four, though? That's the big important question. That is. It is the important question, especially with Amanda Plummer, dude. Like, <laughs> she go, she crazy. She bad at crazy. Yeah, you know what? I didn't make the connection until I think uh, this morning that um, cause when I read it, Amanda Plummer is the daughter of Christopher Plummer, who was yeah, uh, Kang, a uh, Chang, in uh, Star Trek Six, and I was like, oh shit, that makes it so much more interesting. Wow. <laughs> I know, I know. She's just like that. That that again, like the entrances, like the entrances of uh, the the Michael Dorn entrance in episode two. I yeah. saw him at the premiere party. He like he, he came on screen, and I literally I'm in the premiere in my fancy and I was like, "Fuck yeah!" And I was like, oh. <laughs> "That's awesome." Sorry, sorry, you know, yeah. But it's just like the 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 entree of these of these you know iconic characters are were so are so well crafted they're so well crafted and it's and you just if you if you were in love with them before you just fall even more in love with them and i think that's that's what's so lovely and you know and they are truly a joy to be around like they truly are to see those reunions of these people who who love each other mm. so much and to be bear witness to that is really is really it's a really special thing and i agree but i must admit my favorite parts is that or the, those moments with these um non original uh, next generation crew characters they said that you mentioned like uh shaw at dinner it's amazing that first scene when plumber pops on you know uh it, yeah. I mean, there there's some beautiful moments of acting and character that has been missing i think in star trek for a while but they were so perfect in this yeah the they're so good. And, and you know and you know beverly you know gates and ed like I'm a big, I'm a big fan. Of, Ed, I'm, I'm a big fan of Ed Spielers. Like he just, he's a, he's a cool, he's such a cool guy. Um, and I just really loved his, like his entree into this whole stuff and this whole mess, like this whole mess, you know, and at, you know, at watching Ashley, you know, play LaVar's daughter, you know, just all mm -hmm. there's, it's so wonderful because, you know, of course the first episode is called the next generation right it's it's like the next next generation and so you're seeing in addition to all these beloved characters you're seeing yes the next generation but you're seeing family in a different way and it just you know it's it has all of these you know it has our storylines but then it just weaves all of these other feels through it while mm. still like you know they you know they talk about fan service being bad but it's like I don't your fan service i'm like well we're just doing it for the fans i'm like no what you're doing is you understand what people love yeah and you're crafting a story to allow these characters to do things that their fans want to see but in a different way that expands on who they are and then makes you love them even more you know well i'm sure everyone's gonna want to know what was like working with freaks uh ryan and uh stewart um well freaks is amazing especially when he's directing he directed uh episodes the upcoming episodes three and four um he's he's a star like he is just an ebullient ball of energy like when he is in charge of the set as a director mm. he is just like it's it's a loose it just is kind of a loose fun set he has a really great time um patrick is very much you did, I always feel like you're like blah 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 and then you're like oh my god I'm talking to Patrick fucking Stewart dude <laughs> like whoa and there's like you know there's a sense of you know while you're in hold holding is like where everything happens right um or when you're off you know we're in between setups and just you know Patrick is just has so much energy and so many stories to tell like he was I think he he had started writing his his memoirs and like every so often he'd be like blah 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 Rolling Stones, Mick Jagger, blah, and you're just like, what? <laughs> Paul McCartney, blah, what? You know, just talking about this vast, incredible history he's had, both in theater and film and television. Um, and Jerry is just, you know, she's she is strong as fuck. You know, like she's she's so she's kind of in her own way a mom bear. You know, um, she's 
really inclusive of you being on set. Um, we were in the midst of like the pandemic and she was very just like, come on guys, let's get our shit together. Just because, I mean, I am slightly immunocompromised and also, you know, Patrick's kind of old. So it's like, you know, and no disrespect. I mean, the man's 85, yeah. but like, or 80 years old, he's not 85. I didn't mean to age him. Um, but you know, you want to, as much as people would make fun of, and there's like a lot of drama over COVID and blah, blah, blah. Like is when you work that closely with people and you're not sure how it's going to affect them, like you just want to be careful of them. And Jerry was very cognizant of that. She was very vocal in a non like pushy way. Um, and, you know, she's, she's somebody who just is genuinely like a fun and funny person who the crew really freaking lo- like the crew really likes and you do too like but at the same time like I remember coming on and being like I just wanted I mean it's weird when you get on because you just want everybody to kind of like you you know you want to you want to you want to do good you want to and it's just you know you just become part of this family and they welcome you in so across mm. the board like you know I I hope in some capacity, I get to, you know, share screen time with them again in mm. whatever capacity. So what can you tease about the upcoming episodes of Star Trek Picard? Because I'm sure no one, spoilers are totally okay too. If that's... <laughs> Not spoiling anything. <laughs> um, I think you're going to learn a lot about, about um, you're going to learn a lot about Captain Shaw. Um, you're going to watch the crew um coalesce even more in terms of how they care about each other um there's some great twists that i'm super excited for um yeah i think that's about it like i'm like so like (laughs) i've been in this for a year and a half like i couldn't even tell people i was in it so i'm just like "Mm, i don't know i i will be i will be in the next episode that's a spoiler (laughs) Well, Mitch Kelsey, it was an absolute honor to speak with you. Thank you so oh, much. It was fine. And you. Oh, you're so welcome. Thanks for having me.